On March 24th, Timothy Wilson was shot and killed by the FBI as he prepared to attack a hospital near Kansas City where patients were being treated for the coronavirus. The 36-year-old was a white supremacist who had considered attacking a mosque, a synagogue, and a school with a large percentage of black students before deciding on the hospital. Hours before the shootout that brought him down, he had posted anti-Semitic messages on two white supremacist groups on Telegram. Ever heard of Telegram? Me neither. But over the past year, it's been attracting legions of white terrorists due to its very minimal censorship rules. Telegram channels associated with white supremacy and racism grew by more than 6,000 users over the month of March, at the height of the COVID breakout. One white supremacist channel that focused on COVID-19 related messaging grew its user base from 300 to 2,700 in that month alone. And what kind of messaging are we talking about? Oh, you know, the kind that tells white people that they should intentionally infect black, indigenous, and people of color by coughing and spitting on them, putting saliva on elevator buttons and door handles, and spreading the virus into non-white neighborhoods. Messaging that tells white people it is their duty, it is their obligation, to turn themselves into a bioweapon should they actually contract the virus. Many see this as key to accelerationism, which in the white supremacist sense, seeks to hasten the collapse of civilization so that they can usher in a white supremacist government into power. As if we haven't been living under white supremacist governments this whole time? If you're not convinced that white supremacy structures every part of our lives and our economy, COVID-19 has really been laying this bare. I mean, it's been easy to see that almost everyone marching to end stay-at-home orders is white, and that many are wearing Confederate flags and signs that read, give me liberty or give me COVID-19. The fact that they can actually storm capitals strapped with guns and get away with it, and meanwhile, indigenous people peacefully protesting unarmed on their own land are arrested is evidence enough of white supremacy in action. But sure, there are a lot of people who are legitimately struggling right now. Our capitalist system is completely ill-equipped to actually protect people and secure everyone's needs during times of crisis. The US government provided a measly 1200 bucks, but didn't actually guarantee rent or mortgage or debt relief. Many of these protesters, however, primarily want other people to go back to work. They want to go to Applebee's and get their nails done, and they overtly disregard the fact that this will harm people most vulnerable to this virus, Black, Indigenous, and people of color, many of whom will be called into very dangerous working environments just to serve these unnecessary wants. Black, Indigenous, and people of color are being disproportionately affected by this virus, which is really laying bare the racial disparities inherent to our economy. In order for capitalism to thrive, it must perpetually maintain an underclass of people whose labor will be readily exploited to make people at the top rich. It's no coincidence that this economy was founded on slavery and genocide. So let's break down the numbers, which are woefully incomplete because only 26 states have actually tracked and released racial data about the virus. Black people make up 34% of COVID deaths, despite comprising just 13.4% of the US population. In Illinois, black people accounted for 43% of deaths and 28% confirmed cases, whereas they only comprise 15% of the population. In Michigan, 40% of those who died and one third of confirmed cases were black, even though black people only make up 14% of that population. And in Louisiana, 70% of people who died were black, despite them only making up one third of the population. In Chicago, like Louisiana, we have a 70% to 30% disparity. And this isn't only an issue in the US. In the UK, 35% of confirmed cases were non-white, even though non-white people make up only 14% of the population. So what accounts for this? What accounts for these gross disparities in the land of the free, where we have very clearly moved on from racism and discrimination? Being economically marginalized can lead to a whole host of other issues that can lead people to be more vulnerable to pandemics and crises. Lacking intergenerational wealth, which was stolen from indigenous peoples and slave labor, it's far more difficult for black, indigenous, or people of color to get loans, to get access to adequate healthcare, to get access to adequate housing, food security, 
security, education, etc. A 2015 study by the Center for Economic and Policy Research shows that whites with the exact same resumes as their black counterparts are hired at double the rate. In fact, a white man with a criminal history is more likely to be hired than a black person with no criminal past. As well, research found that black men with 11 to 20 years of work experience earn 23.5% less than their white counterparts, and black women with 11 to 20 years of experience were paid 12.6% less than white women with the same experience. And our colonial system was primarily about the taking of land, and indigenous labor was not always actually wanted. And even when indigenous people did come up with their own enterprises, they were often thwarted by settler governments so that there would be less competition for white settlers. Under such circumstances, it's not hard to see why racialized people would have higher rates of food insecurity. In Canada, 48% of First Nations households face food insecurity even before COVID-19. And in the US, black households in 2018 were twice as likely to be food insecure than the national average, with one in five lacking consistent access to enough food, even before the crisis caused layoffs and squeezed food banks. We also know that people of color have higher rates of comorbidities like diabetes, heart disease, and hypertension, which weaken the lungs and the immune system and make the virus that much more deadly to catch. This is due to several reasons, one of them being elevated cortisol levels in the blood for extended amounts of time, dealing with the stress of racial discrimination, the stress of being over-policed, the stress of housing discrimination, etc., and of racism in the food system. It is mostly POC neighborhoods that deal with food deserts where there aren't adequate grocery stores, and it's also mostly POC neighborhoods that deal with what Kristen Cooksey Stowers calls food swamps, areas with a high density of establishments selling high calorie fast food. Tucker Seeley compared economically disadvantaged areas across the country and found that fast food retailers were more common in black neighborhoods of all incomes than in low income non-black neighborhoods. And the legacy of redlining and racial segregation means that middle class black people frequently live in neighborhoods without the resources and protections found in even poor white ones. We can't underestimate the power of neighborhood segregation, Tucker Seeley said. Which homes do individuals get to live in? What kind of lending is available? What is the power of racism throughout the process? And how can it potentially sort people into neighborhoods with fewer resources and more health risks? Nadra Niddle writes, Communities of color have long struggled to access fresh and unprocessed food, and minority workers make up a disproportionate percentage of the food industry, often working for low wages and without medical benefits. All the while, traditional cuisines such as soul food have taken the blame for health problems African Americans face, a critique that overlooks how obesity and type 2 diabetes weren't widespread in the Black community until after makers of processed and fast foods established a foothold in minority neighborhoods in the late 20th century. On top of that, Black and Latinx people are more likely to work in essential occupations, including food service, that require them to interact closely with others. Black people make up 12.3% of the workforce but comprise 21.9% of animal slaughterhouse and processing workers, 14% of grocery workers, and 13.4% of restaurant workers. They also account for 26.5% of employees at Amazon and 21% of the staff at Walmart, the nation's largest grocer. The injustices faced by slaughterhouse workers and the environmental racism of the animal agriculture industry is something that we talk a lot about on the Vegan Vanguard. I'm actually going to follow this video up with one on animals in COVID and the meat industry in COVID, so stay tuned to learn more. But as you can guess, slaughterhouse work is some of the most dangerous and disgusting work that people can possibly do. And because of that, it is done primarily by poor undocumented migrants and people of color who are unable to complain about what's going on to them and the horrors they're facing in that industry because they are status insecure. Environmental injustice or the disproportionate siting of toxic waste hazards or industrial facilities near non-white neighborhoods also leads to air pollution, greater air pollution in those neighborhoods, which once again weakens lungs and immune systems. Black, indigenous, and people of color are also far less likely to have health insurance. And since many people's health insurance is tied to their employer in a time of crisis, if you are laid off, then you no longer have health insurance. Many racialized people also work in the gig economy where they just do not have benefits whatsoever. And they're doing jobs like delivering food where they're coming into contact with a lot of people. Undocumented people are far less likely to actually seek medical care due to fear of being outed to law enforcement. And due to all of this, all of this discrimination, especially processes like redlining, 
Non-white people tend to live in more crowded spaces. There's more people at home, and this is really dangerous in a time of social distancing, especially if many of them have to go out and work their essential jobs where they are coming into contact with a lot of other people. Understanding our political economy, how it works, and the racism and white supremacy that it was founded on, it's horrifying that these disparities in infections and death rates exist, but really unsurprising. But no, no, Karen, you, you go on about the unspeakable injustice of undyed roots. We also have to talk about the prison industrial complex, a for-profit industry that seeks to maximize those profits through incarcerating as many vulnerable people as possible and keeping them locked up as long as possible. We know that Black and Latinx people make up a disproportionate amount of incarcerated people and are harassed, arrested on nonviolent offenses like drug possession, and straight up murdered at much higher rates, despite the fact that white people consistently have higher rates of contraband possession. During COVID, prison populations are sitting ducks. The virus is tearing through prisons, people are not getting adequate care, and systemic racism leads people to think that this is okay. Oh, and when vulnerable essential workers, many of whom are non-white, go on strike for better protections, they're flat out fired and replaced by prison labor. This is slavery, and it's once again leveraging systemic racism to make white capitalists rich. This oppression is really, really profitable for some really monstrous people. On top of that, Black and Latinx communities are being massively over-policed during this lockdown too. Between March 17th and May 4th, 40 people were arrested in Brooklyn for breaking social distancing rules, one of which was white, four of which were Latinx, and 35 of which were black. While officers hand out masks to white people in parks who aren't social distancing, they go into black communities looking for people and have been caught on camera punching people of color over social distancing rules. And as if all that weren't enough, the relief packages. Yep, you guessed it, went to mostly white and male-owned larger small businesses and excluded businesses run by people of color and women. The Paycheck Protection Program, a $349 billion relief fund, was public funding but funneled through private banks. There's a structural flaw in this program. It uses banks as middlemen. Anytime you create a program and give banks the ability to choose which customers it prioritizes, you're going to have disparities, said Mercer Baradaran, a law professor at the University of California, Irvine. Credit disparities are where past injustices lead to present disparities. The major banks, unsurprisingly, prioritize businesses that they had pre-existing relationships with, which tended to be the larger small businesses that were run predominantly by white men. Congresswoman Barbara Lee said that banks can be less willing to provide loans to black business owners or to people looking to set up businesses in neighborhoods with majority-minority populations. She noted that there were very few African-American-owned banks in her California district. As well, the major banks, including Bank of America and J.P. Morgan Chase and Wells Fargo, also prioritized larger loan applications in order to maximize loan origination fees and their own profits. Data shows that bigger banks approved 60% of loans requested by white business owners, 57% of loans sought by Asian business owners, 50% of loans sought by Latinx business owners, and 29% sought by black business owners. Larger loan applications tend to be white and male owned because on average, minority and women owned businesses have 30% fewer employees compared to male or white owned businesses. Their average sales are about 50% to 90% of their counterparts. The major banks doled out all of the money very quickly to their pre-existing customers, leaving the majority of minority owned businesses in the dust. This is a very, very clear example of how white supremacy and capitalism are very intimately interlinked. In Canada, the ties between white supremacy and capitalist exploitation are obscene. An unceded Wet'suwet'en territory and without the consent of the title holders who are the hereditary chiefs, and without even the consent of the Canadian environmental assessment process, the RCMP are ignoring social distancing, bringing in man camp workers to keep pushing the coastal gas leak pipeline through indigenous territories illegally. I've made another video about this, which goes deeper into this land back movement that's happening in Canada, but this pandemic is being used to force through colonial capitalist projects through indigenous territories without regard to whether or not they will be at greater risk of contracting the virus due to exposure from all of these workers 
workers and the RCMP. Many indigenous nations may also face increased risk due to ongoing colonial occupation and oppression, including lack of access to safe drinking water, food insecurity, housing insecurity and overcrowding, and lack of access to adequate health care. But instead of this virus allowing settlers to see the cruelty and incompetence of our colonial capitalist system, what are we doing instead? Blaming China. White supremacy is doing what white supremacy does best, obscuring all of the contradictions and crises of capitalism by scapegoating racialized people who had nothing to do with it. China. 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 This has led to an absolutely disgusting spike in violent hate crimes against Asian Americans, including physical violence, verbal attacks, and people being coughed and spat on. Of course, many of these people aren't even Chinese because bigots cannot distinguish. And on a geopolitical level, neocons are using this as a fantastic opportunity to continue Obama's pivot towards Asia, pivot towards China, which Trump has been ramping up with all this talk of trade war. Imperialism, the last age of capitalism, uses racism to push economic warfare every time. The US knows that its position as a global hegemon is coming to an end. This is going to be China's century. US capital forced the Washington consensus and neoliberal globalization on the rest of the world, and particularly China, in order to increase profits. And guess what? They have sown the seeds of their own destruction. They are now desperate to bring manufacturing back to America, which will not work because corporations will not want to pay people more money and lose out on profits and become less competitive. But they can see the economic tide is turning, so they must make China the enemy after exploiting its workforce and polluting its cities for so long. It's actually funny because one of the main conspiracy theories that ties China to this virus is that it's caused by 5G, their 5G network. And why? Why is this? What does this serve? Well, Chinese corporations are way ahead of us in terms of 5G technology, and we just really don't want to be outcompeted. So while many countries across the global south are already adopting this technology, we are moving to ban it until our corporations can be the ones to service us at much higher rates. The colonial capitalist Anglo world is going down. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but eventually, it's going down. And its last gasps are these embarrassing displays of scapegoating and hypocrisy. The war rhetoric and the pivot towards China just shifts accountability, shifts responsibility away from our horrendous political economic system that destroys what it needs for its own reproduction. Western capital has already used China as a spatial fix. Guess what? There's not many more places we can go. But please, no one look at the fact that we have trillions of dollars to throw at the stock market, but absolutely fuck all for working families or even small businesses. Please, no one look at the absurdity of a privatized healthcare system that drowns suffering people in debt or just denies them treatment altogether during a pandemic. Please don't look at anything but China. It's China. And you know, going after Asian American children, boy, is that ever helpful. Luna Oi and American Johnson have done a lot of work around Vietnam and have looked at white supremacy and people's unwillingness to look towards certain countries like Vietnam, whose policies have been very successful in flattening the curve and keeping people safe. Even Venezuela offered people rent, mortgage, and debt relief, made sure that nobody was fired from their jobs, and made sure everyone could shelter in place safely. And all the US government could do was give 1200 bucks one single time? You want to march for something? How about to smash this racist system to the fucking ground? Big thanks to Tristan from Step Back for editing this video. Very special thanks to my patrons, and special shout out to Genarchist and Emma W. If you'd like to support the continuation of these videos, you can become a monthly patron donor or give me a one-time tip via PayPal. Check out my podcast at veganvanguardpodcast.com. Find me on Facebook and Twitter. Like, share, comment, subscribe, and I will see you in another video.